hope actually all of you are able to hear me because I am sitting in a small town near Toronto and it's uh, pleasantly cool and uh, nice here and uh, I'm, I'm sure actually you're all um, you've all had a very long day and uh, I would like to actually keep my presentation as brief as possible um, and then actually uh, take on questions if there are any and uh, I would like to actually first of all thank all the organizers both individual and institutions behind this webinar and I was first of all actually not very keen on joining uh, because I have actually my 40 years of uh, 40 year plus working life attended many seminars and webinars and sometimes actually seminars and webinars mm -hmm. and uh, conferences are for paper pushing and so what comes up out of that uh, is a big question mark so I was very pessimistic but my uh, former colleague and uh, a good friend, uh, Mr. Tarunda, uh, convinced me that uh, this will be a different experience. So I agreed to join. Uh, I hope actually all of you are able to see my um, PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Are you able to see? Yes. Please. All right. Uh, should I, I have to make an adjustment from my side? I think it's OK. OK. Now, I'm going to actually present the, in, in two parts. The first part is actually um, presenting the situation in terms of actually where, who are these actually unreached people? Because uh, the webinar's uh, main theme is actually technology for the unreached. And um, the term unreached itself could be actually sometimes um, contradictory. Um, it's very Christian. And uh, so who are these unreached? And what actually yes. we have been doing with a focus mainly on India, what India has been doing in order to reach them, uh, if they are poor, actually, what kind of poverty alleviation programs are, have been there? Um, and um, who, who are these? What is the profile of these poor people uh, in different parts of the country? Um, and then actually the second part will cover a critique of what has been actually going on. Um, so. First of all, actually, let me begin with a few um, quick slides on life before independence in India. Not interested. Okay, um, this is self-explanatory. The masters were uh, the colonialists, and we were serving the masters for a long time. Next. Um, this is actually two life, one for Indians and one for the children of uh, the uh, colonizers. Um, so two contrasting life then. Next. And these are actually some road workers. Um, look at actually their uh, plight. And um, I think uh, their, their bodies are actually good examples of their uh, background and situation and economic conditions. And these were road workers. Next. And these are some tribals from Andaman Islands. Uh, I don't know whether uh, life has changed for them and um, what state they are in currently. Uh, this was actually pre-independence. Next. And this is actually a Calcutta street scene, a beggar. Actually, look at actually the technology, um, the cart and the bull and the people, the onlookers and all these things, simple life. Uh, so this is how actually India was. And we know, all of us know that it has actually changed a lot because I know I keep coming to India again and again. Although I live in uh, Toronto currently, I am an Indian uh, because that happens. I mean. If, once you are an Indian, uh, you are always an Indian wherever you are, unless you are a second or third generation uh, Indian origin person. Yeah. Uh, so I keep coming back to India and see the changes that are taking place uh, all over India, not just in, uh, in the southern part of, part of parts of the country that I travel mostly, uh, everywhere. Next. <clears throat> This is again actually a Madrasi, sorry. Okay, skip skip that please. Next one. Almost 12 hours. This is actually vegetable uh, pre-independence. Next. This 
a photograph I liked very much because the technology has changed and we are walking up bullet trains these days. And uh, this is a kind of actually train, uh, I mean, hauled by uh, bulls in, in Baroda. And uh, this, this photograph is now part of uh, the Western Railways. And this is what actually King Gekwad uh, used. And uh, this train traveled a distance of 13 kilometers, pulled by the bulls then. Okay. Now, it's all history. It is useful to actually bear this history in mind. And where are we now? Next. Right. We can be proud, and we are proud, that we are the fifth largest economy in the world now. And the GDP may range from 2.9 uh, trillion to 3.4 trillion, depending upon the sources we consult and the years, base years that we look at actually it may vary. But actually, uh, two point, uh, close to $3 trillion. And uh, the current government actually wants to take India to a 5 trillion economy within a short span of time, right? Um, so India has actually marched a long way and achieved many things in many fields um, using actually technology and scientific advancement um, and then achieved quite a lot, um, not only uh, in, in, in industry, but also in services sector and uh, also in social development sector, although there are problems. And uh, one small point that I want to bring it here is actually the agriculture sector, which is the backbone of the country. And it used to be, it, it used to contribute 43% to the GDP of the country. Um, I'm sure actually you will be able to guess how much it is now, because it is a pitiable 15 or 16%, right? And it has actually declined continuously. So, so what is happening to the rural India? What is happening to agriculture in India? And how people will be fed in the future? So these are actually questions to be debated. Next. Okay. Despite actually all the achievements that the country uh, has witnessed in 73 years, and uh, what is the situation of uh, poverty in India? Because that is the main concern of this webinar, uh, because I assume that the unreached people are the poor, live in remote parts of India, mostly in rural areas. So this is actually from the World Bank. This is actually slightly outdated 2016 data. So one in five Indians, Indian is poor. poor. 20 pro, 27 crore Indians are poor. So these actually indicators are worth actually bearing in mind. Uh, and uh, in where do they live? That is the they are actually living 60% of the people in UP. Uh, because I assume 80% live in rural areas. Okay. Among in rural poor, 27 live in small areas. villages that so have less than 5,000 people. So we have to actually reach them. We have to actually bear in mind all this actually number. So poverty is actually among uh, the tribes, the highest, 43 percent. So this is a major issue. And uh, so should we reach them? And what kind of actually programs, development programs, uh, we have to actually take for them? So these are actually points that are worth actually um, uh, discussing and considering. Next. Okay, In government of India has been actually from the 70s onwards. Garbi at all slogan was there by uh, Madam Gandhi. Um, ever since, actually, India has always kept in mind the rural development. And thanks to the media and the civil society organizations, so they have been actually reminding the government on the poor people, and therefore, actually, governments curse. Has, Successive governments have been actually focusing on poverty eradication, uh, poverty alleviation programs, and various programs have been actually going on. We all know. Um, next. Now, in spite of actually the progress in terms of reaching the unreached, the poor people, and so many poverty eradication programs, we have lifted quite a number of uh, maybe 200 and uh, more than 200 million people 
uh, out of poverty. But in spite of that, one major issue remains is the inequality. Because poverty, more than actually poverty, inequality some, uh, now um, engages India. And uh, it is a major, major issue, not only in India and also in other countries. We will, uh, I will come to that actually slightly um, uh, later. And uh, this is this slide actually about India and who actually are benefiting from the so-called development that is taking place in the country. So if we say, look at this chart. Um, so 10% of the people are actually benefiting maybe nearly seven, more than 70% of uh, the wealth they share it. So the poorest actually have very little, 60% of the poorest you can see, and they have just 5% uh, five, five of the wealth share in the country. So yes, the country has achieved quite a lot uh, in terms of development and progress, but then actually the benefits are not actually evenly distributed or equally distributed. So this is a major issue that the country has to address if it has to actually address uh, the issue of poverty and uh, uh, the, uh, the multi-dimensional issue of poverty. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm going, but it's not going to. Oh, I'll try from my end. Something is wrong. Something wrong with the slides or uh, with the uh, technology? Something, maybe something wrong with the technology possibly looks like. Oh, okay. Okay. So what is the suggestion? So should I actually... If you can, you have the slides with you by any chance? Yes, I do. So can you, because with my laptop, it has got hung after this slide. Okay, okay, okay. Right, I'll um, move on to that. And again, actually on inequalities, um, we know actually the wealth is not equally distributed. Um, therefore, actually the problems are there. Hello, can I go ahead, sir? You, yeah, you please go ahead, sir. Okay. <clears throat> I am so trying to India, today there are 119 billionaires, right? Um, the number may increase, and the, the the prediction is that between 2018 and 22, India will add 70 new millionaires every day. So this is incredible. So India is going to be um, a very rich country, not actually. Um, a uh, very far away um, time, but very soon. Billionaires' fortunes increased by almost 10 times over a decade, and their total wealth is higher than the entire union budget of India. And many ordinary Indians are not able to access the health care they need. 63 million of them are pushed into poverty because of health care costs every year. Almost two people every second. So, uh, what actually, I, the first section, the summary of the first section is, yes, the country is addressing poverty effectively, right? And many people have come out of the poverty, but then actually the inequalities persist, and that is actually a major problem, and that is creating a lot of actually um, disturbances within communities, uh, within regions, and within the country. Now, why this is happening? Because this is actually not the problem of um, the, the programs or policies or technology. And the evidence is actually the technology has been used um, effectively, and that is why actually so much wealth has been generated. Um, but it is actually, in my opinion, my critique, the inequalities are inherent in the established dominant development ideology and its practice in the country, in India, as well as in all countries in the world. Now, how did this happen? And we have to actually go back to history again. 
Harry Truman, actually, when um, the American president in his inaugural speech, he said, we must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. The old imperialism, exploitation for foreign profit has no place in our plans. Greater production is key to prosperity and peace. Now, this is important. The focus actually from the 50s on has been growth and prosperity. So growth and prosperity has, has actually evolved as an ideal development ideology. And every country has actually uh, embarked on that actually ideology. And there is no opposition at all to that. But then what actually growth and uh, prosperity um, will imply? So it has become the implicit next possibility of development, a secular alternative to the Esquire Christian philosophy of peace and peace. Because pre, I mean, in the Western world, uh, before um, 1950, the Christian philosophy actually dominated life. And it also actually dominated the ideas around development and charity and aid and all those things. And later on, actually, this prosperity, I mean, growth and development, growth and prosperity uh, has replaced that actual philosophy, Accept, uh, accepted and adopted by almost all countries, irrespective of the regimes in power, with little or no opposition until recently. Why until recently? Because Professor Solanke was explaining um, very clearly and very vividly uh, the global warming impacts and the need for actually reducing the um, use of energy. So this is a concern. So it, the, the, the problem is now being questioned because of global warming. So what is the practical aims of global development partnerships now? Growth and prosperity, and it is also the program of all governments, and defeat communist leftist agenda and establish superiority of the north uh, particularly western europe and the us so this has been actually achieved to a great extent right um, through this ideology of prosperity and development now we can actually be used we we, we hear many terms modernism high modernism postmodernism uh, so these are all actually terminologies associated with actually this new development paradigm, growth and prosperity. So general belief in scientific and technical process that accompanied industrialization in Western Europe and Northern America from 1830 to World War I has since acquired an imperialistic nature to the extent of devaluing and dismissing local knowledge. This also Professor Solanke touched upon. We undermine the uh, local knowledge and local people, and we go as a kind of actually superior human beings and impose ideas, technology, and alternatives on uh, the poor people. And then worry and when, when they don't cooperate, we worry, oh, actually, they don't know. They are not aware of uh, the development uh, implications. So they are not actually participating. So therefore, actually, participatory approaches are uh, being tried. And it has actually, this process has become a dominant worldview today. And nobody can actually imagine questioning this ideology. Why prosperity and growth is important uh, in order to alleviate poverty. That is how actually leaders, celebrities, and development professionals, everyone naturally today uh, explains and, uh, and, and justifies the current ideology. So it influences every government, bilateral and multilateral organizations, not only actually bilateral organizations, even the UN has been completely sold um, on this ideology. And being questioned and challenged due to global inequalities and environmental impacts. And this is where actually uh, Mr. Solanke's presentation is relevant. And um, the environmental um, damages that this ideology and its practice application actually cause is enormous. And that is why actually now uh, there are actually opposition. So yes. The, the leader, the global leaders and the UN may justify uh, the application of the model because 
the world has generated quite a lot of wealth. Every country follows the U.S. as a model for development, including for it's, India. And every country, ideology and whether you practice travel in Africa actually or Latin America, is every country is and that is why actually now towards, uh, there um, are actually opposition. Having a life similar to that of people in the U.S. So, Yes, and I was actually the leaders, some global leaders, leaders and the UN. Fair, if just every fall. person in the world tries to lead a lifestyle that is similar to that of an African uh, average uh, American, we would need five Earths. So this one Earth will not be sufficient. Um, so therefore, actually, uh, this is a questionable ideology. And world wealth again, actually, inequalities at the global level. You can see actually five, six countries dominating, you know, and uh, the world leader. Why actually America remains uh, an engine of this development paradigm is because actually it shares quite a lot of the world wealth. And for the rest of the world population, it is inequality. So inequality needs to be addressed um, as part and parcel of challenging this uh, paradigm. Now, one example, actually, what has happened um, as a result of this dominant ideology is the high tech companies, uh, the tech companies are actually dominating. We know actually the five um, American tech companies, Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft and Facebook, they're worth actually five trillion dollars and which is much more than the GDP of Germany. And this will, they will continue to influence, the do, influence and dominate future technology. Uh, therefore, actually, all the companies, whether they, whether they talk about corporate social responsibility or they are in, or supporting philanthropic activities, they will be within this paradigm. Um, this is why, this is where, again, actually, I will also bring in Gandhi, right? Gandhi was actually misunderstood during his time when he said actually machines are enemies, his enemies. Um, so the, the, this is a quote actually from his um, Swaraj, Hind Swaraj book. So he says, the spinning wheel is a machine. A little toothpick is a machine. What I object to is the craze of, craze for machinery, not machinery as such. The craze is for what they call labor saving machinery. Men go on labor till thousands are without work and thrown on the open streets to die of starvation. I want to save time and labor, not for fra fraction of mankind, like actually the five um, technical giants of mankind, but for all. I want the concentration of wealth, not in the hands of a few, but in the hands of all. Today, machinery nearly helps a few to write on the back of millions. Mm -hmm. The interest behind it all is not the philanthropy of the neighbor, but is against this constitution um, of things that I am fighting. So God, this is a kind of prophecy um, of um, Gandhiji, right? And we have to actually ponder this and uh, look at actually what we can do um, and what alternatives are there in order to actually move away from this paradigm. Because it is not actually some technological um, innovations here and there, but actually a kind of wholesale transformation of ideology, paradigm shift. This has to take place. So that will require a strong and good governance, redistribution of wealth, listening to the poor, so it is actually, it's, people actually talk about crowdfunding. We need to actually source ideas from common people, poor people. Um, so uh, crowdsourcing must create truly sustainable development alternatives and technology. Gradual lifestyle change from mindless consumerism to responsible consumer. Now, these are all actually important if we are interested in challenging the current paradigm and if we have to reduce global warming and if we have to actually really and truly reach the unreached and if they have to become part and parcel of the uh, development of the country whichever country they are in thank you very much